attitude. We are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order. Hello and welcome to the debated podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will, and I'm joined by my co-host, Conrad. Hello. And in this episode, we are delighted to be joined by Philip Norton, Baron Norton of Louth, who is a Conservative peer and a uh, historian, a uh, professor of history at the University of Hull, and one of the country's foremost experts on constitutional history. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Delighted to be with you. Uh, I should correct you, though. I'm, not, I'm a professor of government rather than professor of history, in case my colleagues in the history department um, take any offence. Not at all. Um, uh, the first question that I would like to ask is, uh, recently the, the government has passed uh, legislation regarding uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic, which we are all going through at the moment. I wondered, uh, what are your thoughts on that legislation? Uh, do you think it goes far enough, doesn't go far enough? What are your thoughts? Well, clearly it's extremely severe in terms of the powers it conveys. We've had a, a similar debate before with the Civil Contingencies Act, which confers tremendous powers on government should an emergency arise. This one is obviously tailored to this particular emergency. It's passed with all party agreement to address uh, the problem. Um, and really, there are two issues, I think. One's the actual content, the sheer powers it confers whether we've got those right or not, because, of course, there was tremendous pressure to get the legislation through quickly to address uh, uh, the problem. So there's that, um, the actual scrutiny of it. But as tends to be the case with something like this, there is the um, injection of a um, what's known as a sunset clause. So it's for a limited period. It's not indefinite. So there'll be an opportunity to review it. Um, but the other is the nature of the crisis it seeks to address, because that actually has a significant impact on Parliament itself, how it does its business, because we're so used, obviously, to coming together physically to scrutinise government to call it to account. So it places a tremendous uh, burden now on Parliament, how it continues to do its job, not just in getting this legislation through, but how it, it, it maintains its scrutiny of government, how it deals with other legislation that government wants to get enacted. Now, you mentioned um, sort of the changes in sort of Parliament um, and with the coronavirus outbreak, and there's been talk of having maybe a virtual parliament when everything has to sort of end after, after the recess and everyone sort of would, would usually be coming back. Do you think this is a good idea? Do you think um, virtual parliament could be a good idea? And do you think it could be something that is sort of more used in the future? Well, I'm not sure it's a good idea as opposed to being a necessary one because it may be the only way we can actually proceed in the near Future. I mean, we're meant to be returning a um, couple of weeks' time, but whether that's possible in a physical sense, certainly all members will not be um, returning. So this is potentially a short-term uh, expedient. It's already been used. Some committees are already meeting uh, virtually. That can continue. There is the potential, obviously, to, um, which is being realised, to um, take evidence. So that's doable. It's it's what's being addressed at the moment is, is what the, each chamber does in terms of debate of being able to question ministers. And, and so that's been addressed as a matter of some urgency to try to get something in place so that um, both houses can continue to some extent um, in, in present conditions. Now, as you're touching upon it, there's then the question of what goes um, beyond that once the current crisis is over, will this be continuing meeting virtually? There may be to some extent with committees. Obviously, it gives one a great degree of flexibility. Um, historically, one's always had an element of it, obviously, in the sense of being able to interview witnesses who might be overseas, for example. But it could be extended. Whether one does that on any wider basis, as far as the chambers are concerned, uh, remains to be seen. But obviously, it's one of those things we'll have to wait and see how it operates as to 
um, whether there is a significant legacy effect. Presumably there will be a legacy, but just how extensive will depend on how well it works and whether in any sense it is better than what we have at the moment. And now you mentioned the uh, legacy effect there. I wonder what do you think will be the impact of uh, this current situation on the way that uh, not just politics uh, mm. works going forward into the future, but also society as a whole? There are so many fundamental implications, and I don't think we'll see those until uh, we're through this. So um, obviously one of the things that people are reflecting upon is how well can people work remotely, work at home? Is that more efficient? Um, obviously, we're seeing certain consequences from an environmental point of view, which are seen to be beneficial. So for some, it may make uh, just as much sense working from home. They might find that preferable. Others uh, might not. So that might be a legacy effect. Um, I mean, there's always the potential, of course, that if this drags on, that people I'll sort of want to revert to old practice the moment it, it's over. Um, simply that sense of relief, being able to get back to the office, to the you know the old ways, and almost putting this uh, behind them. So there could be quite a lot of cross pressures uh, at work um, because once this is over, one might find that not only people want to revert to normal practice in terms of working behaviour, but of course suddenly decide well make up for lost time in terms of travel getting around. So one can see all sorts of short-term consequences, what the long-term consequences are. It's going to be very much a matter of waiting to see how this all works out and how long the current crisis continues. Now, one um, constitutional um, thing that has come up very recently with um, Boris Johnson's illness, and he is out of intensive care now, and we wish him a speedy recovery, is... Um, what happens when a prime minister is temporarily incapacitated? Um, Boris gave Dominic Raab power to deputise where necessary, but the UK system doesn't have a formal deputy prime minister in the same way, a vice president in America or in a similar chain of command. Do you think this is something that needs to happen in the future, or do you think that um, this, you know, this kind of ad hoc way of doing it is sort of more flexible and a better way of doing it? As you say, the advantage is one of flexibility. There are precedents for it. So there is some understanding of how we proceed, but there is no formal protocol uh, to cover it. For constitutional reasons, it's to do with the prerogative. There is no designated formal post, as you mentioned, of being deputy prime minister. In other words, someone who steps in and, and would be seen as the successor in the event of the Prime Minister ceasing to be unable to fulfil that particular role. And to some extent, there's not seen to be a need for a successor in that sense, because normally if a Prime Minister steps down, they stay in office until a successor is elected uh, as party leader. But you need something in place in case, as you've touched upon, the Prime Minister is temporarily unavailable, but remains as Prime Minister, which is separate from uh, another issue, is it, which is if there's a vacancy, we have no prime minister. If any prime minister uh, uh, died or suddenly resigned without waiting for a success to be appointed, then that creates a situation as well, um, which has been difficult to for the formal constitutional position to keep up with the political reality of the party leader now being elected by the party membership, which can take uh, a considerable period uh, of time. So I say the formal position is not kept up because the last prime minister to die in office uh, was Palmerston. Um, in terms of the prime minister being temporarily unavailable, the prime minister remains the prime minister, the Queen's principal uh, minister. So somebody else can be designated to step in if the prime minister is not able to fulfill uh, the job on you know, for whatever period. Um, and that person fulfills, if like presides over government, keeps it running without themselves actually becoming uh, prime minister. There's a distinction between anybody being designated as deputy prime minister or first secretary of state. A deputy prime minister is actually a title. It's not a formal post. It's not salaried. First secretary of state is a formal post. That's the one that Dominic Grab occupies in addition to being foreign secretary, so it denotes some seniority, well, it denotes seniority uh, among 
uh, secretaries of state. But it's entirely up to the prime minister who is invited to stand in should the prime minister be temporarily uh, unavailable. There's plenty of precedent because historically prime ministers of some type needed to be away, official business out of the country in the old days when When Winston Churchill was Prime Minister in 1953, uh, he was seriously ill. His number two, Sir Anthony Eden, uh, was also hospitalised. So it wasn't made public about Churchill's condition, but other senior ministers sort of stepped in and kept, kept the government running, not just for days or weeks, but actually for two or three months. So it is somewhat ad hoc, but it does have that degree of flexibility. Um, but it's someone who stands in for the prime minister without becoming prime minister to keep the wheels of government uh, going. You've got a cabinet that can take the decisions. You've got the cabinet committees, which is the route through which policy is normally determined. Um, and they carry on uh, as usual. Um, now, you mentioned that. Uh, the comparison between um, uh, the American system and the British system. And in your book, uh, The British Polity, uh, in the introduction, um, you discuss the fascination that uh, the United States has uh, with Great Britain, its history and its politics. I just wondered, do you think that that fascination, particularly at such polarising times as uh, we live in now, is because of the depths of uh, the differences that exist between the two nations, even though that they are nations that have shared histories and uh, a shared language? Well, we are fundamentally different, I think, in terms of political culture and how we go about problem solving. And I think there's probably an element of the grass is always greener on the other side, uh, looking at a different system, perhaps thinking, well, that's got benefits we don't have without necessarily looking at the uh, disbenefits. So there's really no comparison between uh, the two systems. They are fundamentally different in their formal construction, the constitutional framework. And the reason for the difference is because they derive from very different uh, political cultures. Um, so there's really no element where one can borrow from the other um, because you'd need to change the whole system itself. So therefore, the other system is fascinating because it is uh, so different. We look at the American system and find the way they do politics um, quite amazing. But then they look at us and um, may admire our system, but there aren't really elements they can um, uh, import. You can't translate elements of the British system into the American uh, or vice versa, because the, the transplant wouldn't work because you're not transferring from one compatible body uh, to another. Now, um, one difference between the American system and our system, and one that's sort of fairly unique to our system, is the fact our upper chamber is mainly appointed. You are yourself a member of the House of Lords, a life peer. Um, what do you think about the prospect of reform as the House of Lords well, and, and its role in our constitution? Well, I'd correct you for a start. We're not unique in the sense of being an appointed second chamber. We're not that uh, unusual. There are a number. There is no sort of common form for second chambers where they exist, which mostly they don't. Two thirds of legislatures are unicameral um, and of the rest, which are bicameral. Some are wholly elected, some are party elected, some like us and the Canadian Senate are wholly uh, appointed and there are different benefits to seem to be derived from that, I mean, it, from our point of view, having an appointed second chamber is compatible with our system because, if you like, we get the benefits of a second chamber without the disbenefits that affect accountability at the heart of our political system. Because under our system, you have the governments elected through elections to the House of Commons. So when voters know, vote, they know what they're voting for. They're voting to put a particular party in government. They know roughly what it's promising. Um, and so they can compare parties. And once a party is in government with an overall majority, it can deliver on its program. It's accountable for that program. Um, and it is held accountable through the House of Commons and through elections to the Commons. So you've got, if you like, court accountability, which is not then challenged by having a second chamber, 
which performs certain functions, but does not challenge the primacy of the third. So uh, the Lords can't do anything unless the Commons basically agrees um, to it. So we add value in terms of the functions we fulfil, but do not challenge that court accountability. If you start to elect a second chamber, you've then got problems of it expecting to have greater powers or even ex exercising the powers the current second chamber has, which doesn't exercise them to the full because it accepts the primacy of the commons. And therefore, the dangers of, of conflict between the two and deals being done to get legislation through, which then undermines accountability because there is then no one body electors can hold to account for the outcomes of public policy. At the moment, there is this one body, the party in government, that's responsible for public policy and therefore can be held accountable. If the two st chambers are elected, start arguing with one another, um, producing outcomes that people haven't voted for, who then do people hold electors hold to account. So that's the benefits of the system we've got at the moment in terms of having an appointed second chamber. One can distinguish that to some extent from your question about reform. One can have reform of the second chamber, which does not necessarily mean election, but reforms within the chamber to enable it to be even more effective than it is. I mean, generally it's held it does a good job. So when people talk about reform of the House of Lords, You'll notice the debate is almost invariably about composition, not to do with powers or performance of functions. And when governments have tried to move towards an elected second chamber, it's always been premised on accepting that the current house actually does rather a good job and the government's not sought to change its functions or its effectiveness in fulfilling them. Um, now, you mentioned accountability there and um of course, we've recently uh, had a general election with uh, the Conservatives uh, winning a substantial majority. Do you think that um, part of the furore uh, that has been seen and, and felt by a great deal of the public uh, regarding uh, Brexit and Britain leaving the European Union is due to a feeling by the public that um, they weren't able to hold uh, the government to account that the government weren't, or that the Commons at least, weren't yeah. acting in the way that they felt that they should. No, absolutely. There was a real problem in the last Parliament, the Parliament of uh, 2017 to 2019, which essentially was unique in, in modern political history, because what you got was the use of a, a, a UK-wide referendum, which is really rare, but it's now part of our constitutional architecture. So there was a referendum 2016. The following year, you had a general election, which produced an outcome where most members did not necessarily go along fully with uh, that outcome, or certainly a majority who were opposed to a no-deal um, Brexit. So you, if you like, you got a clash of legitimacies um, between, um, if you like, the uh, popular democracy popular legitimacy is exercised by the people in a referendum and representative democracy through the House of Commons. And so there was a clash. You had, uh, as I say, one particular outcome. Uh, electors um, voted a particular way in a referendum. Next year, they elected House of Commons, which then, to some extent, was taking a line not necessarily congruent with that. And that raised fundamental questions of accountability, because electors cannot hold themselves to account for the outcome of a referendum nor can they hold to account a transient majority in the House of Commons, which is coming up with uh, results that conflict with government, where the House itself was trying to wrest control from government of public policy. And that's not consistent with our system. And our system is based on the House of Commons and Parliament generally responding to what government brings forward. The government's always been in the driving seat in promoting public policy to which Parliament then responds. And so that's maintained core accountability. So we're in an unusual position, I say a really unique one, in that uh, Parliament, because there was then no one body that electors could hold to account for the outcomes of public policy, or in that case, arguably non-outcomes, because um, there was a majority against things, but not really a majority for uh, a particular 
outcome. So the 2019 general election, if you like, brought to an end that very particular situation, which was causing such conflict uh, within our political system. What do you think have been the best and also the worst constitutional reforms and changes in the last 50 years? Um, It's a very good uh, uh, question. In a way, the, the, the principal problem has not been any one constitutional reform. It's been the discrete nature of the reforms themselves, by which I mean we've had several major reforms in recent years and on a scale we've not seen for centuries, but without any coherent to the change we've seen. So if you think about the big changes that have taken place over the years, each has been justified on its individual merits. So the constitution we're ending up with is the sum of its parts. If you like, change has been bottom up, these particular reforms being introduced. It's not been top down in the sense of any clear view of what type of constitutional framework is appropriate for the United Kingdom. So therefore, we're not working towards any particular type of a new constitutional settlement or constitutional framework. As I say, it's just the aggregate of these several changes. So the reforms have essentially been disparate and discreet, and it's really the consequences of that that I think is problematic from the point of view of our constitution. Uh, How do you think most people would interpret uh, the British constitution and um, understand its main features and mechanisms because obviously there will be some people who will be able to see oh well the American constitution fairly clearly set out whereas the British constitution is not as clearly set out in one particular um, document. Do you think that that's an issue with people uh, getting engaged with the constitution and in getting engaged with um, government and parliament? Well I think that point you've made is a very good one and it identifies actually uh, a problem. Um, now, I'm wary of saying I would think most people view it in that way because you'd have to have evidence and I'm not one to claim that I can see into other people's minds. But there's obviously a lot of awareness, I think, of, of the fact our constitution has um, a degree of flexibility because it's not codified. That's the main thing. I know it's popular to refer to it as unwritten. Most of our constitution exists in written form, but it's not in uh, codified form. So the main tenets are not drawn together in one document that we can hold up and say, this is the Constitution of the United Kingdom. Um, Now, most other countries, we're not unique, but we are distinctive in not having a codified constitution. Um, Where there is this codified constitution, it's important to remember, I think, two things. One is that the constitution, the document, is not simply the constitution, because the constitution is more than the document, because the document is a form of words, it's written in fairly general language. It's therefore got to be interpreted. So the constitution extends beyond the document to judicial interpretation of the meaning of a constitution, plus the fact the actual terms of it will be complemented by uh, convention, uh, by legislation that has constitutional implication. So it's more than the document. But the other point is that people think, oh, we know what's in the document. Well, you might know what the document says. You don't necessarily know what it means until the courts have interpreted and interpreted it and given their interpretation, which could be very different to yours. So it doesn't necessarily give you the assurance uh, you might uh, think. You're dependent on others for interpretation. So I think that point's an important uh, one in terms of people looking elsewhere and saying, well, we should have a codified constitution. I'm not sure it deliver the benefits that people claim for it. There are practical problems anyway in, in actually trying to implement one in this country. In terms of perception of our own constitution, I think there is some degree clearly uh, an awareness that we don't have a constitution. There is that degree of flexibility and there are those who think, well, that's a clearly um, a 
problematic, we need more certainty. Against that, as I say, you, you could end up with one where you don't necessarily get much more certainty until you've got uh, the interpretation. You could try and get round that by having a far more detailed document being more precise um, to limit scope for interpretation. But once you do that, the danger is something of a constitutional straitjacket in terms of those uh, uh, provisions. You need some degree of flexibility. So even with a codified constitution, you've got that flexibility. It's designed to be a living document so it can be interpreted over time. And those interpretations change, sometimes, as we see in the United States, quite significantly. Now, you've mentioned a lot about um, judges and judicial interpretation of laws. And obviously, we had a quite controversial Supreme Court decision in the UK to do with the Brexit legislation um, and the proroguing of Parliament. Do you, do you think that um, we are sort of shifting in a way of, to a more politicised judiciary in terms of more similar to what they have in the USA with appointed judges that are sort of seem to fall one way or the other? Or do you think that this is sort of a unique thing to Brexit and we can return to sort of the idea of judges being above everything? But it's not necessarily unique to Brexit because there have been other judicial decisions that have been quite uh, controversial. And, and so one can see it as a consequence of different developments over time. Because our constitution has, has acquired a juridical dimension it previously lacked, partly as a consequence of our membership of the then European communities, later the European um, Union, um, that added a, a, a dimension because it, it gave the courts the powers to strike down domestic legislation in conflict with European law. But it could, the courts could only do that because Parliament said they could under the provisions uh, of the 19, in effect, under the provisions of the 1972 European Communities Act. Uh, another uh, was the Human Rights Act, which by its nature rather general it's up to the courts to interpret so that gave them significant role although they can't strike down legislation they can issue issue declarations of incompatibility uh, and those are there have not been many but some have been quite uh, controversial and of course the creation of the supreme court has not necessarily given different powers to our highest court it's just moved it out of the palace of westminster from being the appellate committee of the house of lords to being the supreme court so the law lords moved across parliament square but it gave the court um made it slightly more detached um geographically um but in a way set it aside because it's somewhat different from westminster now uh, and therefore people uh, parliamentarians are a little less aware of it and who the members of the Supreme Court are. So there have been various developments and, and some, as I say, um, significant cases deriving uh, from uh, our membership of the European communities, deriving from the Human Rights Act. And then in, in terms of Brexit-related legislation, of course, uh, the Miller case and then Cherry and Miller um, too, which have been quite uh, controversial. So the courts have acquired, our senior courts have acquired sort of greater political visibility, but ultimately in a system where the courts, juries still large, accept that the fundamental principle of the British Constitution is the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty. So the courts still have to operate within that. So they can always be overridden by act of parliament. As I say, with the European communities, um, courts acquired uh, new powers, but those were powers exercised by virtue of Parliament passing the European Communities um, Act 1972, and, and Parliament could have repealed that act. The effect would be de facto to take us out of membership, although it put us in conflict in international law at the time. Now, the Lisbon Treaty gave us uh, the capacity in international law to withdraw, which is what we've uh, done. But ultimately, the courts are working within the powers, uh, the law set by Parliament, and Parliament can always uh, change the law. So parliamentary sovereignty is still that one fundamental principle of the British Constitution. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the podcast. It's been uh, great to speak to you, uh, Lord Norton. I think it's been a very uh, interesting discussion. I have uh, one final question I'd like to ask. Uh, recently, uh, Hilary Mantel uh, published the final novel in the uh, Wolf Hole trilogy, The Mirror and the Light, which features a, a rebellion in Louth. And I wondered, um, 
what do you think is the uh, importance of Thomas Cromwell in defining the separation of um, Parliament from the monarchy? Because I know that certain authors, such as Hilary Mantel uh, and Geoffrey Elton, uh, have in the past argued for Cromwell's importance. I wondered, uh, where do you think? Do you think he, he is a, a significant figure in making Parliament more independent? Well, I'd make the point as well that Laos has a reputation. It has uh, been the source of uh, the start of some rebellions uh, historically. So the degree of independence um, has been uh, marked the place. Um, yes, I mean, if you look, it, our history is defined because we are unusual, because of the longevity of our history of the how our constitution is developed really over a, a millennium. So there are various critical junctures and various actors that have contributed to that. I'm not sure you separate anyone out. So whether it's the emergence of parliament in the 13th century, um, some sense of war, the glorious revolution, the emergence of political parties in the 19th, various actors along the way. Uh, and obviously the name of Cromwell comes up in different, uh, uh, capacities have really contributed to the way um, it's developed uh, over time. Um, so uh, we are marked by a degree of continuity. Um, as a critical junctures, um, the protect, period of the protectorate following the Civil War um, was unusual, of course, because at the end there was the restoration, the attempt to put things back to what they were before. And during the period of protector, it was the one occasion when we did have an attempt at a codified uh, constitution, which, of course, didn't last uh, very long. And very briefly, the, the House of Lords was abolished. Um, so come 1660, you had the restoration. But that was exceptional. Otherwise, it is that accumulation over time of key players. Uh, and you can't really know what would have happened had they not existed and done what they did. I mean, we'd spend an awful lot, given our history, one can devote one's whole time to thinking, what if? What if X had not existed? What if X had not done? Uh, so, and so. so it's just understanding the contribution they've made, how it's all come together over time, and just identifying, if you like, all the key, pl key players uh, over the course of our history and recognising, if you like, the actual impact they've had um, and perhaps distinguishing that from, it, with some of our history, the mythology um, that, that, that's built up. But we are the sum of, um, uh, obviously, a rather lengthy um, accumulation of events throughout our history. Uh, that was a great response, and I'm sure that our listeners will have found it a, an interesting response. Thank you uh, once again for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe to us on Spotify, iTunes, Spreaker and YouTube. If you'd like to follow us, you can do on Twitter at Debated Podcast. Uh, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast. And if you'd like to email us, you can do at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you listen to the next one.